Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right then. Um, so Deb is a mythological studies professor and an English professor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as am I. Yep. Well, adjunct professors, but that's a whole other conversation we don't necessarily need to get into right now. Probably not today. Yeah. <laughs> we teach at the college level things of uh, stories of literature and of mythology. all story, right? Yeah. All story. Yeah, absolutely. So with that little introduction, um, Deb, would you like to introduce us to the hero's journey? What does that mean um, to you? Yeah, sure. Um, so first of all, we're talking about um, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, right? I, mean, I know this is probably going to be inverted, but um, here's my little bargain basement copy that I found somewhere and I've read a million times. Um, and so it's kind of kind of a funny story. Um, I used to teach ninth grade high school English, right? And um, that everyone's like, hey, you should teach the Odyssey. And it was like, that was new. So I was like, yeah, I'll teach the Odyssey. And I didn't really know anything about the hero's journey. And I stumbled upon it in one of my um, lesson planning binges, right? And um, I taught it to the kids and they freaked out. They, they just loved it so much. I'm like, give us more. And I was like, oh, okay. So I had to go back and I kept finding more. And then I got really, really into reading a lot of Joseph Campbell's stuff. And I just kept, it was like, I was just throwing him at him, just like animals and raw meat or something. And so they just inhaled it. And obviously I kept that lesson in my, in my uh, plans for a long time. Perfect. Um, and then, you know, right. <laughs> um, and it's, it was, it was great. And it always gets um, a huge, um, a huge reaction from students. And I even teach it in all of my English classes too. And my, I have students sometimes, you know, repeat students and they're just like, oh, here we go again. Like, we're going to talk about this again. It's like, yeah, you can skip this day or if you want to teach, I could take a break, you know, it'd be great. But, um, but it comes up a lot. And um, I think the reason it comes up a lot is it, it feels very universal. It feels like a, a universal connection to something bigger than ourselves, um, which is great. Um, that being said, as I've advanced in my own studies, right, I'm a, I'm a mythological studies professor, but I'm also a mythological studies student, as are you, and working on our PhDs, um, our dissertations. And um, part of my job in that regard is to deconstruct the hero's journey. That's, that's part of my dissertation and to try to figure out how we can improve it for today's time. And um, there are some issues with it, obviously, um, as, the, as there are issues with, you know, everything. And this everything. was written, yeah, <laughs> this was written a long time ago, um, but it's very much a patriarchal construct uh, in, in the words that it uses, um, in the experiences um, that happen within the hero's journey, um, in the language that is used to describe it, um, and also in the, the ego of, of the audacity to be a hero is um, very patriarchal in our society. Women don't um, typically get that unless we're um, bad bitches or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, and, but that's a judgment statement too, right? You have to become a bad bitch in order to do something independent for yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole other conversation. Um, <laughs> and um, anyway, that being said, sorry about um, that being said, it still has value to look at the hero's journey. And in order to be able to deconstruct it and figure out what's wrong with it, you have to understand what it is, right? Great. So you got to start there. Um, okay, so hero's journey. Um, a lot of times if you um, are in sixth grade or eighth grade um, or ninth grade in my case, um, you learn the hero's journey has 12 steps right? Um, and you and can let's say for those wanting to follow along at home, there is a book can, where all this information is contained, right? Called The Hero's Journey by Joseph Campbell. It's The Heroes um, with a Thousand Faces. Oh, A Hero with a Thousand Faces. Mm -hmm. There's also The Hero's Journey that was published in 1990. Hero with a Thousand Faces is 70s? Yeah, I think it's earlier than that. Let me look. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, an, it's a way early, earlier book. 49, 1949. I know. 
<laughs> yeah so he was working on this for a while um and there's the power of myth i mean he goes into it a little bit mm-hmm. there you can google the hero's journey and look at the steps i mean they're everywhere um the one thing that if you have had me as a student um you know i'm gonna say this is most of the pictures that go along with the hero's journey are wrong um the hero's journey should be counterclockwise and not clockwise um because going on a hero's journey is counterintuitive to what most normal people would do. And I say normal in quotation marks because whatever that is. Um, And um, yeah, so it goes against, Joseph Campbell also called it the left-hand approach um, because in his day being left-handed was odd, right? Um, And that became a thing. I know, Mike, I have a kid who's left-handed and I'm stupid, but... Um, yeah, again, if anybody's interested in that, we could do a whole other episode on <laughs> yeah. where that came from. What was this, 1946? So 49, whatever I said. Mm-hmm. 1949. So, I mean, the ideas there are antiquated. And again, it's the lens through which we're viewing these things is inherently old white guy, right? I mean, he wasn't mm-hmm. so old then, but I mean, the, that's exactly what we see. So that aside. So um, there are the 12 steps that you can actually say they're up to 18 steps, depending on how detailed you want to get. But for the most part, it's taught as 12 steps. Um, the first one is, um, is the call, right? The hero. Um, well, I'm sorry. No, that's not true. The first step is the ordinary world. Um, and we can use any movie that you want to possibly use um, and look at this. Our hero wakes up in the ordinary world. It's their life. It may not be perfect. It may not be great, but they, um, they're they used to it, right? Um, Harry Potter, right? In the cabinet under the stairs. Um, I don't know. What, what movie do you want to use? The Incredibles. Luke Skywalker. Yeah, Luke Skywalker wakes up at his aunt and uncle's house, right? Um, mm-hmm. They're all in there. And then, then they receive the call. Um, the call can be anything, right? Um, it can be... A ring that they find in their uncle's um, uh, cabinet, or it can be a letter from a magic school. It can be a missed. Taxi. It could be a. It could be a map to One-Eyed Willie's treasure hidden in the <laughs> attic. Yes, it could. It, it could. could. It really could. It really. Could. It could be a letter shooting down the chimney. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. It could be anything. Um, it just the point of it is to call the hero from into someplace uncomfortable, someplace new. And um, usually the, um, the, the reaction of the hero is to kind of crouch down, is to get low, is to go to the ground and be like, no way am I doing this. It's a refusal of the call. Um, there's no, he doesn't want to. Or, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use he because of, of this construct and I'll get into why um, I, I didn't use she at the end. Um, even though this obviously and tune yeah. in next week when we'll talk about the heroine he. journey, you know, mm-hmm. he or she, yeah, exactly. Well, and I mean, you can apply this theory to female heroes as well. We have Katniss, but she actually fits better within the heroine's journey. Um, which we'll we also about. have Dorothy Gale, right? Wakes up yeah. in the normal world. What's her call? Maybe yeah. a tornado, a tornado, maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Um, so after um, after they refuse the call, they sit around for a while and then they're like, yeah, I, I probably should go do this. So they, they have no choice, right? They, they're they're so reluctant uncomfortable. Hero. Yeah, we were reluctant here. They have no choice, but they have to go. Um, and the hero begins his journey. Um, and as soon as that happens, when they're going on an adventure, um, they meet up with the mentor, right? The mentor is... Um, a hero that's already completed the journey. They have the knowledge that the hero needs. Um, and this is um, the person to give them wisdom or sometimes a magical thing to help them along like a wand or a ring or a lightsaber, right? They usually get a- or Ruby a, slippers. Ruby slippers, absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, they they start to learn how to use this. And this is the movement. They begin to- kind of move into that heroic role. They start to understand, okay, maybe maybe this is something I can do. Um, and they, they cross the threshold into that new world, right? And they, they begin looking at new things. And it's a, this is always a great moment in, in the Hero's Journey movies, right? When uh, Luke Skywalker walks into that bar, right? With all of those different um, aliens, or I don't know, what, what do we call them in space? 
intergalactic uh, species sure we'll go with that <laughs> no i'm and, not a star wars person you can't call I, me out like <laughs> I, i'm sorry where's my kid the cantina um, yeah the cantina <laughs> yeah <laughs> that one mm-hmm and that's literally like the strange place, right? And he's just like, right. ah, the Harry Potter, right? It Hagrid taps the, the bricks and then the bricks fall away. And then Diagon Alley is right there, which is such a clever name because no. diagonally it's off mm-hmm. the beaten path of, oh, mm-hmm. so good. Anyway. Um, so good. Or perhaps, perhaps the call is falling down a rabbit hole. Yeah. And absolutely. you're in a, you're in the upside down. You're in the upside down. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the mentor and the hero go on. Usually they meet up with some allies. Um, there is usually two people and they, if you want to look at archetypes or something, they are, they complete the hero in in some way. Um, for Harry, Hermione is the brains, obviously, and Ron is a good strategist. Um, you don't see that as much in the movies as you do in the books, but at least they literally say it in the movies. They're like, Ron, you're good at strategy. You know, he plays chess, <laughs> right? And then you're supposed to be like, oh, okay, he's a strategist. Um, but um, Harry is neither of those things. He doesn't think, right? He moves. He just wants to go fight. That's that's his temperament, right? He's, he's like angry. driven by passion, right? Yeah. Or yeah. It's like the personal vendetta. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And so, um, so they, they meet up, these allies help out. Um, they start to have a little bit of fun, maybe start to win a few of the fights that they're, um, that have been placed in front of them, um, by the, the gatekeepers or, um, like the, the lower of whatever's evil in their world. Right. Um, and they meet up with some enemies, like I said, and they fight with them, um, which is super fun. Um, and they start to really love this world. Um, even Simba, right? When he meets up with Timon and mm-hmm. Pumbaa um, and they're out there just having a blast, right? And they just, they're loving life. Um, so once these things happen and after each trial for the hero, he, get, he becomes a little bit better at whatever he's supposed to do, right? You see Harry, he gets better every book or movie on his magical abilities, right? Um, another brilliant thing about those is um, the way he gets to Hogwarts and everyone is different. It's like a little bit more complicated way to get there, which is cool. It's very symbolic. Um, and I just, I love that. Um, okay. So now um, the hero has approached the peak, like all of the mini bad guys are, are beaten and here comes the big dude, here right? comes the, the shadow. boss, the yes. big boss, the big boss. And he's probably going to have a long speech about why he's making this poor hero's life awful. Sure. Um, and Joseph Campbell called this going into the belly of the whale, right? Jonah in the whale's belly. It's literally a dark place. Um, and there's a lot of things that happen here. And this is where I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of months studying and reading um, because of my dissertation. And um, the, the ordeal happens. The hero is almost beaten by this shadow villain dude. And he has to decide on whether or not he's going to go on. Um, and it's sort of a death, right? Um, for, for us in life, um, our adolescence is bringing on a new sort of life. We get the adult life, right? Which totally, I want my money back on that. Um, <laughs> what? Um, like who, who said that? anyway yeah um but there is a we we have these little deaths and rebirths all the time in the in the hero's journey this is the big one and a couple things happen to the hero in this um area um the first thing that happens is um he has to go alone uh, according to campbell and this is where i actually argue with campbell and say no you don't because your allies are part of you um and maybe you're physically alone but you have all of that knowledge and you have all of that experience um and um, so you, once you're there alone, the first thing you do is you meet with a goddess, right? Um, and for Campbell, um, the goddess stood for everything. The goddess was the destination. Um, she was both birth and death. Um, in Western mythologies and religions, we kind of see that separating a little bit. Um, we don't, we only get the birth part um, of the, like the Virgin Mary. But in a lot of the Eastern um, mythologies and religions, you see um, the goddess um, is, has both usually. Um, and um, she, for Campbell, is the totality of 
of everything, all the beauty and all the ugliness, right? We see mm. those, we hear that all the time. We have the, um, the Madonna or the whore, we have um, the, the virgin or the crone and the crone can be an evil grandma or she can be, you know, uh, what's her name? A benevolent old witch. Yeah, the benevolent old witch or whatever. Oh, the fairy godmother. Yeah. Bifidi bopidi boo. Um, but either way, a totally asexual being. Yes, yes. And yes, it's an asexual being. Although, um, for Campbell, um, it, maybe not. Um, he does this whole little section on a woman as a temptress, um, which is where it can get a little weird. Um, but, well, that would be the whore, though, right? But I yeah. mean, like, within the crone archetype, oh, usually yeah. these are, like, women that are past their prime and not sexual in any way, where the, the yes. maiden or the damsel right. is promise of the cusp of sexuality right and that yes and yeah yeah, you're right and she she is the totality so the goddess that's down in the belly of the whale is the totality of all of that she is all three at once right like hecate or um and and she um is everything that can be known and you have to enter that space with that goddess and invite that part of you inside you have to become okay with that and if we're looking at a male hero, that's accepting femininity, it's accepting love and morality and honesty and openness and communication. These are things we always attribute to feminine principles, right? Um, but um, sometimes that can be difficult for a hero, um, which is where the woman is the temptress comes in. Um, and I like to use Hamlet and Oedipus um, to talk about them, right? <laughs> because... They both just have light, just, light, just light stuff, like light, light texts. They both have an inherent um, moral image of their father, right? They think that their dad, I mean, mm-hmm. Oedipus's dad is a king, right? Well, so was Hamlet's dad. And Hamlet's dad was the greatest dad on earth. And um, then he's, they both have this re- relationship with their mother. And sometimes, like, depending on who's playing it, Hamlet can get a little incestuous with his mom in that big fight they have. Um, which is an interesting take. <laughs> I saw that. I was like, whoa, okay, that I didn't ever read it that way, but sure, why not? Um, but regardless, he hates his mom for marrying his uncle, right? Uncle stepdad. <laughs> so, and um, Uncle Scar? Uncle Scar, yes. <laughs> Weird. I didn't know that. Wait, what? What? Um, and so they search for this higher spiritual connection. And they start to, to forget that body connection, right? Because females, all the um, because we're birth and death and and everything, we are we are very much in our bodies, and so they begin to look at that connection to their body as evil or wrong, and so it becomes they, a projection of hate, and um, yet they're still attracted, maybe not necessarily, hopefully to their mothers, but to the to the feminine, right? Right. And um, so then they they start to evade the world and they they don't want to be a part of it. Um, OK, so that's the meeting of the goddess. Then if if the hero can get through that, then he has to atone with the father. Um, I love what Joseph Campbell does with the word atonement. He breaks it up and he calls it at one meant um, mm. where you become one. Yeah. Right. It's pretty cool. Um, he goes into a lot of detail um, about the the puritan sermon you know the one where um the god is a large hand and we are just the tiny spiders and he's holding the spider over a flame and it's only through his mercy that he doesn't drop us into the flame and yeah it's pretty scary you okay i'm sending that to you um it's terrible here's a really powerful tool yeah yeah it is and that's he calls it the ogre aspect of, of the father right you you rule out of fear and, and respect, and there is no love. Um, the love comes from his mercy, right? Which I had to stop and think today. I'm like, how do we go from fear and respect and turn that into mercy? Like, I don't under understand the connection, like how we got there. Um, I mean, it feels like that's a good foundation for like our victim blaming culture. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Victim blaming, um, um, just inherent hatred. Of, it's like a mob boss, right? Yeah, like, yeah, kind of. Yeah, you are you are lucky and should be grateful that nothing negative has been happening to you. Instead of, you should be grateful that good things are happening for you. Yes, 
that's a really good way to explain it. And so he talks a lot about that and, and the child has to overcome that. The child has to overcome mm. the father and become the father, right? Um, especially as a, in these hero journeys, like when a lot of religions celebrate um, turning into a man, right? Becoming a man around age 13 when adolescence starts, right? Mm -hmm. um, 13, 15, somewhere in there. And um, there's a lot of, you probably know more about this than me, about um, different cultures that have these mask ceremonies where they, the men come and kidnap the boys from their mothers and take them out to the woods and scare the bejesus out of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then reveal that they're the actual um, guy there the whole time. And they're like, oh, that's my dad. And then now I, and then they put on the mask. It's, it's, I mean, it's literally that whole thing that we just talked about. Right. Um, and once you learn um, that you become that father person um, and you have to, again, be open, you have to visit the goddess first so that you're open to that elevation. Um, and we call it the apotheosis, right? It's the moment we become divine. We die to our old selves and rise up as the hero. And so we resurrect. Um, and um, once we resurrect, we are now the hero. We can kill the shadow um, or in psychological terms, integrate it into our psyche and individuate. Um, and then we get to celebrate, right? We get, we get to um, feast on the dragon that we've killed. Um, and um, we can take our knowledge back. Um, a lot of times there's some sort of um, boon that the hero gets, like Harry gets all three of the Deathly Hollows, right? He's technically immortal at this point with all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a hard, it, that'd be hard to give up, right? You start thinking, well, maybe I should have this. And this isn't the, like the last test for the hero. And um, he has to usually split that gift up and, and, give it to his whole community um in harry's case like he breaks the wand and throws it away um which is really cool um and it, he doesn't want that power um and he's ready to turn around and share that power with everybody um and um that's my favorite part of uh, buffy and I, I don't know if i can talk about spoilers on buffy it's been around long enough i would think but i don't know I won't. Well, um, what it made me think of is Charlie Bucket at the end of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, yeah, right? And yeah. all of the other characters getting plucked off along the way and mm -hmm. him being the chosen one at the end mm -hmm. and not because he proved that he wasn't going to bring the recipe to Slugworth, right? He like proved right. that he wouldn't keep that for himself, but he would do what was best for the community mm -hmm. and then brought his whole family to live in the chocolate factory with him instead of like ascending, yeah. on, his own. ascending on his own or Simba, right? Coming back to the mm -hmm. pride and defeating Scar and sharing the wealth of, of everything, um, which is what exactly what a hero should do. Um, so yeah, that's the return with the elixir and that's, that's the hero's journey. That's the hero's journey. So we brought up a few different archetypes just kind of quickly in there. We talked about some of the female archetypes mm -hmm. and we talked about, um, a little bit about the mentor. Um, <laughs> but since we have time, do you want to do a quick little rundown on intro to archetypes? I mean... I can, uh, yeah. I can start. I can help yeah. you. Why don't you do, um, why don't you start? <laughs> okay. Um, so we have this narrative formula, right, of the hero's journey. Um, and it is said that in every story of the Western literary canon, there are seven archetypal figures represented. Yeah. So we need to unpack that a little bit, right? When we say Western, we mean like the storytelling conventions in Europe and like the European diaspora. Yes. Um, and then when we say literary, we mean like novels, poetry, but also stuff like TV and movies, right? Like yeah. this is how we consume our stories today. Mm -hmm. um, canon doesn't mean like a pirate canon, it means a collection. And then what the heck is an archetype, right? What does archetypal mean? It's probably a word that you've heard before, um, but it's kind of like a, a pattern like 
something it's that's recognizable. instantly recognizable, right? And can be can be copied, kind of like the bare bones of a character, and then that character will get or convention, and then that will get fleshed out according to different cultural beliefs, values, customs, um, the time period it's told in, all of those things. But you have like that same character at the core. So when we talk about like the Lion King being an adaptation of Hamlet, we see the core of those characters are the same, right? Even though they're presented differently or they might have a few different quirks to well, them. I mean, and you could you could apply that to all heroes, Harry Potter, mm -hmm. um, Simba, mm -hmm. um, Katniss. I mean, they all have very similar archetypal qualities because right. they're the same character, right? Um, a right. hero has to usually is, has to start out sort of immature um, or unlearned or something and they have to grow they have this character mm -hmm. arc is the journey right that's what they and have there to go has on. to be a character arc that's so important to talk about because like if you're like me and you're a huge stephen king fan <laughs> you may have been disappointed in stanley kubrick's the shining because the lack of development of jack torrance's character right mm -hmm. we can't start Jack Torrance off as totally unhinged, a la Jack Nicholson, even though he plays it great, right? You have right. to, like Drake said, you have to start at the bottom and like then then be here. Um so so yeah, so one of those four main qualities that the hero needs is they have to be a little immature and maybe um lacking in wisdom because they have to grow. I'm trying to say this nicely. <laughs> yeah, and um, they have to be willing to give up part of themselves for the greater mm -hmm. good that's that there is a sacrifice um the sacrifice. for the hero and yep. that gets lonely and, and it's painful and all of those things and which is why they usually refuse the call in the first place um, uh yeah because it hurts. like it hurts growth <laughs> and change and progress hurt like that's the lobster <laughs> you have to be comfortable in dis sitting in discomfort otherwise you're never going to grow yeah and there's there's the death and the resurrection, the dying to the old and the and the rising to the new. Look at an mm -hmm. acorn, right? It, it's completely destroyed, but then it grows into this beautifully strong um, oak tree, right? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. A mighty oak. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. So four main qualities of the <laughs> hero, not selfish, is willing mm -hmm. to sacrifice their own desires for the group. Mm -hmm. And they must be starting at a point where they can grow in both wisdom and maturity. Yeah. Um, they can really be any age or gender, mm -hmm. technically. Mm -hmm. um, and then the audience has to be able to identify with the hero in some sort of way, right? They have to be like the protagonist um, right. of the story. Yeah. And they have some sort of goal to find the treasure, to save the princess, to do something with a ring and a volcano. I'm not really clear on what that is um get rid of the ring throw oh, it in the volcano it. throw yes. it in the volcano okay because it's evil okay. oh mm -hmm. okay um yes i am a mythologist who has not seen lord of the rings nor read it um not my, not my bag baby um <laughs> so with our hero all of these quests are metaphors for feelings right um okay. and the hero is the one who conquers the dragon, not who is devoured by the dragon. Right. Um, but everybody has to deal with that same dragon. But there's no hero who has never met the dragon mm -hmm. or who, if once he saw it, declared afterwards that he saw nothing. So the hero has to be made of something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and oh. oftentimes has to leave their home. Which is just rude. I mean, although I listened to a really great a presentation by Chris Vogler um, last year in the middle of the pandemic, the quarantine lockdown and everything, and he associated the hero's journey with the quarantine lockdown. And it was fantastic the mm. way he was able to, to bring that together. And, and they're really, he very wisely predicted the second curve to like a plot line, right? Because real plot lines, like that weird thing that the kids learn in school is not accurate that's it's usually you go up and then you go up and then it's just straight down it's, oh like the little like bell plot mm -hmm. yeah that's not a thing um, introduction build up 
yeah. IMAX. Yeah. And then resolution. 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 Yeah. <laughs> but you have like you have an ordeal and then you have like the big ordeal. So you have to right. have those two things match. Um, yeah. Oh, and one thing I didn't say um, when I was talking about the hero as he starts to go on, if you watch movies and or TV shows and the hero finally accepts his journey, there's always a water scene. There's always some sort of baptism, um, which is hilarious. Oh, see, and you went straight to baptism and I went straight to birthing waters. Well, sure, that too. Yeah. I mean, Neo in the Matrix was literally birthed. Um, he was when he came when he took the which pill is it that you take the blue pill? I don't remember which one's the change pill. Oh, God, I've seen that movie so many times too. I don't know. I've only um, seen it once as an adult. Oh, okay. Uh oh. For, okay. for one of our classes. <laughs> wow. Um, okay. I, teach I know. That I'm movie so, in my I'm, film studies. I'm so. not a huge Keanu Reeves fan. I'm just going to say it. He plays himself in Bill and Ted, and I love that. And that's where I'm. Okay. All right. I can't take him seriously. Yeah. Okay. It's I'll a personal you problem. This. I know. I'm so it's sorry. It's okay. Um, but yeah, there's this, even in like um, Google Hunting, when um, the main character, like he's mopping, he like throws the mop water and like steps in it. I was just like, oh, mm. there it is. Um, you can, there you can it find is. it. Yeah. Ooh, I'm going to have to look out for that now. Yeah. It's, it's pretty fun. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's the hero. Um, what's the next archetype you want to talk about? The mentor. The mentor. So they have to be old and have long white beards, even if they're a woman. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, it's usually an old guy with a long white beard and he's got a sword or something. I don't know. Um, usually, wears... I mean, but that's when we're like, that's old school. That's like, that's does Gandalf school. have a school have a sword? Yeah. Uh, Dumbledore no, has a wand. Yeah, he has a wand. Um, Alfred Pennyworth. What does he have? all of Bruce Wayne's fortune Merlin at his disposal. Um, he's Arthur's mentor. Wait, I'm sorry, you froze there for a second. What'd you say? Oh no, I said Alfred from Batman. Oh yeah, um, yeah, he he's- uh... I mean, he's like providing all the tools and the gadgets, but he's basically like the one that has access to the fortune and the technology. Mm -hmm. Like- Yeah, he gives Batman, Bruce Wayne's he makes Batman. Liaison, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's good um but yeah so they and they you rupert? they have to have the wisdom rupert rupert why is rupert Bernie? rupert giles oh yes giles it's pronounced giles um y'all i'm a millennial i'm really screwing the pooch <laughs> on this one tonight <laughs> magic glasses giles, Just kidding, magic. giles. Yes. giles yes and he takes them off whenever Buffy irritates him. It's great. Um, he cleans them all the time. I'm surprised there's any lenses left by season seven. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they have some wisdom to impart, right? They have um, And this knowledge. would be Obi-Wan Kenobi too, right? Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, and they, like I said, they impart some magical gift somehow or some piece of clothing or something that, that'll offer it. and even the the fairy godmothers in um sleeping beauty right they give her mm -hmm. the dress and in cinderella she gets the dress and the shoes and the um the carriage right the fairy godmothers are the are mentors as well so yeah <clears throat> okay all right and then i think next we have the herald the so, herald go ahead no we yeah, talked a little bit about it but yeah we've got like these three main qualities of the herald right introducing the hero to the start of their adventure motivating the hero to like get out of their comfort zone and mm -hmm. move on out of the ordinary world um mm -hmm. and they don't have to be human like deb was saying earlier like it could be this this call could be a missed taxi it could be a tornado it can be a letter um mm -hmm. anything that like pushes our hero yeah. Harold's a change coming. And so, um, um, one, um, one thing I've seen in, in modern days with movies and such is if the Herald is a person, typically also the shapeshifter, um, which we can get into. Um, so like in The Incredibles, right? The Mr. Incredible literally gets a phone call um, from the girl who um, wanted or was the shapeshifter she ended up helping him. 
So, um, but yeah, so the shapeshifter um, is probably my favorite archetype in the hero's journey because um, you never know if you can trust them, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're usually the fun character. Um, they're either super evil or super good and then they change right at the end. Um, shapeshifting doesn't mean literally, right? They, I mean, although sometimes it can, um, but it, this means personality wise or whose side are you on, that kind of thing. Right. So right. Snape yeah. is a great example. I think he's the most perfect example of a shapeshifter. I know. I know. And yeah. the shapeshifter is going to be testing the ability of the hero to make sure like their moral compass is straight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, they could be a spy that's working for the hero's shadow. Um, and sometimes they could even be a love interest of mm -hmm. the hero. Um, and shape shape shapeshifters are really dangerous. Like Deb was saying, like they, some of them literally shift shapes, but mm -hmm. more often they're, they're shifting their personality or their alliances or something like that. Yeah. Um, like every Bond girl ever, right? Mm. Uh, yeah, she's a shapeshifter um, because she's, you know, they sleep together and they have a magical night and then she stabs it in the back um, or mm -hmm. tries to poison him or steals his car or something, right? There's mm -hmm. always something that she does. Yep. I mean, there's Han Solo, there's Jack Sparrow, which is kind of my favorite example of a shape sh shapeshifter in those movies. Mm -hmm. um, he's chaotic, he's unpredictable, he helps the hero sometimes and he goes against the hero at sometimes. Mm -hmm. And he yeah really wear that eyeliner let's be honest <laughs> for sure um yeah yes let's just all take a second to appreciate that <laughs> thank you okay threshold okay. guardians so these are the mini bad guys right um these are the the red shirts and star trek i want to make sure you get that right i'm so nervous <laughs> that i'm gonna mess that up um, or like the stormtroopers in Star Wars, right? There's a really mm -hmm. stupid joke about that, um, where they say the uh, stormtroopers shot at the red shirts and completely missed, but the red shirts died anyway. Uh, <laughs> they're always yeah. dying. Um, and or the hyenas or yes. um, the flying mm -hmm. monkeys. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are all those guys are. Um, like the, the the intro to danger or the intro to the evil mm -hmm. um it's like in a world. video game where you have to like level up right you have right. to beat all those little tiny mini bosses mm -hmm. at like along the way and then you get to the big final boss in the exactly. last level yeah and sometimes the um the gatekeepers can be physical as well um which is interesting um mm -hmm. and so it can be a literal gate like in the Iliad, right? Um, or the Odyssey, um, when the city of, of um, Troy shuts down, right? They, and then the, the Greeks, we call them the Greeks, they weren't really the Greeks back then, but for simplicity's sake, um, <laughs> whatever. Um, they, you know, waited him out, tried to starve him out and uh, he couldn't get in. So yeah, could be that too. Yeah, so some kind of, some kind of obstacle Mm -hmm. whether a person um like i was about to say a place person place or thing um <laughs> i mean kind yeah, of kind of though yeah right yeah. like or some sort of circumstance that the hero has to overcome um mm -hmm. whether that materializes as a person or some sort of some other sort of obstacle so right. the guardian's always going to test the hero's abilities so is the hero ready to face their shadow and has the hero learned their lessons? Um, and oftentimes, if the hero has learned something, they take something, some piece of knowledge or like a physical piece of treasure that they need to solve the puzzle, mm -hmm. right? Like if you think of the Goonies, every threshold they got to, like playing the piano in the right way, or, mm -hmm. you know, like it was every little tiny booby trap that they had to get past and survive in order to. Get to get the, the boon cash, right take the boon. yes yeah and yeah. so all of those are basically like scaffolding our hero i guess you could say mm -hmm. like level up video like in who wants to be a millionaire yeah 
Oh, yeah. Like you we have to keep up. progressing steadily. And he's literally a shadow. The, big one. the banker is literally a shadow. <laughs> wait, I <laughs> right. Oh wait, no, that's I think that's, that's who wants that's let's, that's the other one. That's the deal one. That, deal or yeah. no deal. Yeah, that's there we go. The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> deal or no deal. Sorry, not in the millionaire. No, there's no shadow there unless the host like, is a shadow. I yeah, was sorry. Like, are you talking about Regis? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> we shall not speak ill of Regis Philbin. You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's move on to our tricksters. Um, tricksters are great. great. Yeah. Tricksters are so great. They're funny and they're naughty and they're likable mm -hmm. and they're both helpful and distracting to the hero. And a lot of times they're twins. Really fun. Right. Ooh, are they twins? Sometimes. Yes. Sometimes. Like in Harry Potter. Yeah. Yes. The, the twins are the tricksters. Which um, I love because then they literally become tricksters. Spoiler alert. And they open a joke shop, right? A prank store. Yeah. <laughs> Did I have to give a spoiler alert? <laughs> I don't, maybe. I don't know. I, I, did, I couldn't talk about the end of Buffy. I mean, maybe. Mm, yep. Yep. Um, but yeah. So, um, or Timon and Pumbaa, right? R2D2 and C3PO. Yep. Um, all those little guys. They're, yeah, they're the tricksters. So, they're comic so relief. They're comic relief. They're agents of chaos. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, they can help it's, or distract. It's, it's, it's their job fabulous. to do both. Yeah, and so um, a really famous, a really, really, really famous trickster um, is Bugs Bunny, right? Yes, that's absolutely. like such a perfect example for the trickster mm -hmm. archetype. And Bugs Bunny, of course, is based on Briar Rabbit, um, mm -hmm. who is of course, based on the hare, who is a trickster from West African mythology. Mm -hmm. And during um, the transatlantic horror nightmare of kidnapping people and enslaving them and bringing them to the United States, um, that animal changed from a hare into a rabbit because mm -hmm. rabbits are local to the um, mainland United States. Mm -hmm. And then that character became Briar Rabbit, who became Bugs Bunny. Mm -hmm. Yep. So fun. So Agent of Chaos. Agent of Chaos. Yep. Bugs Bunny does look really good in lipstick, though. He sure does. <laughs> he sure does. He sure does. Just, just like a classic trickster. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So which the next one? Are we at the, the big shadow. one yet? Yeah. Okay. Yay. <laughs> so the shadow is everything the hero isn't. Um, they are literal foils. And if you're not familiar with that term, it's like holding up navy blue and black next to each other, right? You can see the differences better when they're together than when mm -hmm. they're apart. Um, like or that. like, yeah, or like foil, like literal tin foil, right? It's shiny and it you know makes things. Um, highlights things it reflects things yeah that's the word i wanted to use that's the one so hi how you doing i'm in the middle of writing a dissertation <laughs> words are my life i don't know them what is um, a brain what is a brain if i only had a brain okay um oh, yeah Mark. okay okay um, so so the um shadow well, our hero is, is bright and shiny and yes. likable our shadow is dark oftentimes physically ugly mm -hmm. um sometimes they the hero has a nose sometimes the shadow doesn't <laughs> right right um but oftentimes there's some sort of like physical marker that this person or character Are. is um on the outskirts of society and there are all sorts of complex racial and cultural biases into what we consider as physical markers of evil but that's mm -hmm. another conversation for yeah. another day yeah um well if you look at darth vader and luke skywalker um mm -hmm. luke for the majority of the time dressed in white all the time right and darth vader was clothed in black and there's that one little scene where um everyone thinks that luke is coming over to the dark side he's left his friends he's hanging out with his his dad right and um you see um, his, and he's wearing black at this point, but his little um, foldy thing is is down and you see a little patch of white underneath. So you mm. know um, that he's going to go back to the, to the light, to the good side. 
And so, to the um, resistance. Yeah, yeah, to the resist to the force, um, mm-hmm. the good side mm-hmm. of the force. Um, but yeah, so um, and like Voldemort, right? Um, right. Basically, is, you can't have a hero without a shadow. You can't because no. then the hero is just a regular person. Yes. They right. Like it's only something. in this contrast that mm-hmm. they become the hero. And oftentimes yeah. it's the shadow that defines the hero to begin with. Right. Uh Oh, spoiler alert. Darth is Luke's father. Yeah. Well, that's in the name. So. Well, yeah, it is. <laughs> Darth Vader. is Luke's father. Yeah. Um, Voldemort made Harry Potter and scarred him and provided this foundational piece of his soul inside of him Mm -hmm. right for and and that made harry who he was um and the 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 shadow has to um has to want something too and here they're they're each Mm -hmm. other's antagonist um they they are each in each other's way and like the prophecy in harry potter says is one they can't one can't live until the other while the other is alive or i forget exactly how how it's worded but um they can't they cannot live or complete their their life goal while the other one exists like peter pan and captain hook yes (laughs) like peter pan and captain hook (laughs) or typically from the 90s blockbuster hit movie hook starring robin williams yes that was so great and dustin hoffman he played hook right? and dustin hoffman they yeah. yeah they had a really great scene at the end while they were fighting mm-hmm. um about about death being the greatest adventure and he says no but to live would be the greatest adventure of all mm-hmm. but one of them cannot survive right because yep. in taking over the shadow the hero accepts that piece of them and is a whole complete person again but they have to both defeat and embrace their shadow or their dark side Mm -hmm. i mean god george lucas was just right on the nose with all of these names (laughs) oh yeah um well you know a really good example of a shadow character is um dr jekyll and mr hyde right dr jekyll is is the psyche he is the person and mr hyde is his evil side that comes out when he takes his secret or a special potion or something right and he has this uh, he has to wrestle with that and in order for him to become a fully integrated person he would have to accept that shadow part of himself mm-hmm. um and collectively and i i've been working a lot on this uh, this week collectively for women i think this is sort of a revolutionary time of looking at the shadow of what it means to be a woman and accepting those what have been called negative things for so long um, and claiming those, it's it's going to be interesting to watch that integration. I'm excited for it. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because we we definitely have a cultural shadow. And for those yeah. unfamiliar, the shadow is a psychological concept. Um, basically, that I really love. Robert Bly calls it the long black bag we drag behind us. And yes. I really like that explanation for it. Yes. It's basically, and I, I feel like we've talked about this before on Happy Hours, but in case you're in case you're new around here, um, the shadow is all of the pieces of yourself that have been expressed and then repressed, right? Mm-hmm. They've been put into this bag and the older you get, the heavier it is and it you mm-hmm. drag it with you everywhere. And until you like turn around and confront what is there um, and embrace it as part of yourself and accept that you are both a positive and a negative being, the yin and the yang, right? There's mm-hmm. no good without evil. There's no evil without good. The black suit with a little patch of white for Luke Skywalker. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's completeness and there isn't completeness if you're repressing any parts of yourself. So you need to yeah. figure out how to integrate pieces of the shadow within you like like these like axe throwing places that have been popping up that's a good example if you have like some sort of violent urges you get them out in a healthy way by throwing mm-hmm. axes at the wall or Perfect. going to those like destruction rooms where you just like get a bat and you smash everything in there um that is like releasing God, why didn't you have in those a healthy I was, way i wish i would have had those when i was raising teenagers that'd be great 
<laughs> but yeah, like those types of things, like, and a, a negative manifestation of the shadow could be like in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, when somebody is maybe taking a substance or drinking and kind of like engaging in negative behaviors in a bad and shameful way and trying to pretend that they don't exist. Oh. Um, and so it is said that all of the people that we don't like in our lives are basically just our shadows <laughs> reflected back at us. That, um, that one that we're we're projecting right yeah but, um yeah we're projecting out what we what's in our shadow and we're receiving that but because our ego is not going to say hey, hey we recognize that in ourselves we push it away and say we don't like it mm -hmm. yeah think of like the things that most annoy you about somebody and that's mm -hmm. probably some sort of insecurity <laughs> you have about yourself mm -hmm. um or or something that you've been told is wrong and bad all your life and maybe you wish you could do and that you're mm -hmm. a little bit jealous of. Yep. Um, like people who maybe dress a certain way and get told that it's trashy or whatever it is, but they still do it anyways. And maybe there are a lot of people that are like, I wish I had the confidence to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But instead of it coming out like that, because it's an unresolved piece of their shadow, they're like, look at that terrible person. Mm -hmm. and how bad and gross that is or whatever yeah absolutely the shot we could probably do a whole happy hour just on the shadow we could do a thousand happy hours on the shadow and <laughs> still sure. not <laughs> yeah it's 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 a dark subject <laughs> sorry um <laughs> but or I'm you could be like peter pan and like wrangle your shadow wrestle it to the ground and sew it back on yourself to make sure Oh yeah, yeah, it's always part of you. It's always part of you. You it's don't want that shadow to run you. off. <laughs> so yeah, and then is that the last one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the last one. Those are all the archetypes. The shadow, our big, our big boss. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. So yeah, it's a lot. And then when we even when we start to apply the hero's journey to ourselves and our own psyches, and looking at life as a hero's journey, in figuring out and accepting who we are um, mm -hmm. and overcoming those things. Campbell was big on the mother father relationship to the child. Um, and he relied a lot on Freud and Jung um, for, for those examples and all of their work. Um, <clears throat> I have been studying the sibling relationship or what, you know, they call the horizontal relationships and how those, how you can have hero's journeys within those. Um, I think the one thing that most of the pictures of the hero's journey gets wrong to circle back um on the hero's journey i'm just i found my words um <laughs> but <laughs> um is that it's not a circle it's a spiral mm -hmm. and we keep going through them and then we we drill down and until we get to that essence of ourselves and then accepting that and becoming who we are and confident in who we are um is the completion of the journey so can we ever do it? I don't know. Stay tuned. We'll find out. Well, and I think it's also an important thing to think about is that we all like to consider ourselves the hero in our own stories, but in somebody else's stories, we might be a threshold guardian or we might be the shadow yeah. or the Especially trickster. Especially students, they come in, they're like, dude, you're the shadow. And I'm like, haha, no, I'm the trickster. Just kidding. Ooh. Um, I know I yeah. had a serious, like, what are they called like a philosophical crisis oh fine. existential yeah. crisis there oh, we good. go yeah those are always um fun. i was driving a few years ago driving to work to go teach at the community college i teach out in san diego and i'm listening to pink floyd and you know i'm jamming hey teachers leave them kids alone and i was like <laughs> oh, oh no <laughs> i'm the teacher yeah. I'm the man like <laughs> I have turned into everything I thought I hated <laughs> and um that was a really startling <laughs> really startling um realization for but me. I bet it changed your teaching practice too it sure did I bet yeah I remember that day too <laughs> it was like oh exactly. oh no the star we should we should take the oath of do no harm um as teachers because <laughs> oh yeah. my gosh yeah. wow that's great
Yeah, we really should. <laughs> okay. So hopefully this was, I mean, it was a quick intro. It was, yeah. the yeah. it was the bite-sized, um, introduction to pieces of the hero's journey and the archetypes contained within that narrative structure. Mm -hmm. Um, let us know if you, can think about a movie or a story that you're familiar with that fits this pattern. Um, yeah. Cause I bet it's, I bet it's more, it's more stories than you think. Um, oh, yeah. What's the classic? It's like uh, a kid wakes up at home and <laughs> realizes that they have been called to something greater than themselves that they don't understand and they don't want to go, but they go anyways. And along the journey, they make friends and they make enemies and they fight mm -hmm. battles and learn all about themselves at the end. And the world. Yeah. And the world. And then they mm -hmm. come back home and they teach their community what they've learned. Mm -hmm. They bring these lessons back. Mm -hmm. And like we said, that can apply to Harry Potter, uh, Luke Skywalker, mm -hmm. Moana. Mm -hmm. Dorothy Gale, um, Katniss, your pick, yeah, Katniss yeah. Everdeen, Alice in Wonderland, Neo, Alice in Wonderland, Neo. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're I all mean, there. Yep, the incredible every Disney movie ever, on and on. Yep, yeah, so yeah, yeah so sure. um, Avatar. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, but that has a whole other like colonizer, white savior. Thing oh, the dances and it it's dances date. and wolves dances with wolves, wolves yeah. in blue right yeah it's the same exact same movie exact or same movie. fern gully yeah <laughs> yeah sure it's literally fern gully <laughs> it's literally nice um, <laughs> sure. another great movie starring robin williams and tim curry please check it out if you haven't mm -hmm. um so next week we are going to dive a little deeper sideways in a different part of the pool um, yeah. into the heroine's journey. Mm -hmm. And do you want to give a little preview into what that? Yeah. Um, so like. um, the heroine's journey um, is, is a book written by Maureen Murdoch. Um, and she got into an argument, right, with Joseph Campbell and was saying, you know, women need their own hero's journey. And he was like, no, you are the destination. You don't need a journey for yourself. This is this and that. Yeah, that's probably the face she made. And so Can you see um, my eyelid twitching like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so she she went home. I like to say she went home and wrote this. I'm sure it took probably more than one night. And Probably a lot of times and actually she talks about the the journey to writing this in the book itself but um it's a it's a close look at how women have to adapt to um the patriarchal worldview in order to individuate on, for themselves to become the heroine um and that's part of that that whole culture of the patriarchal construct that i was talking about i love the heroine's journey because it gives a voice to the female journey however it's still kind of it was very much nestled in the in the patriarchy and and um doesn't quite see its way out of it um although it's an excellent first step i think um so we'll, yeah we'll definitely talk about that there's some steps that you have to go through before you can even get to the hero's journey because of because of being a woman and what what it entails what it means to be a, a female mm -hmm. so we'll talk about that It'll be fun. It'll be very fun. And, and if, if you love Moana or Katniss, if you love we're going to talk a lot about that. <laughs> Ariel. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are interested in any of these books, you can find them all at fernwaycollective.org. Um, if you'd like to purchase through us and support our nonprofit, um, you can get 10% off if you use the code I like big book. And yep. on that That's note, awesome. anything. <laughs> All right. I do. I do like big books. I sure do. And I cannot okay. lie. I can't. Well, I probably couldn't. My face gets all red. I'm not good at it. <laughs> okay. Then how can you be the trickster? All right. <laughs> okay. um, oh, you caught me. So, yeah. Thank you for joining us tonight with the Hero's Journey 
Tune in next week, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, where Deb and I will be talking about the heroine's journey um, here on Facebook Live. Yay. Thank you. Finger guns.